All right, it looks like we're about five minutes past. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight. It's a good turnout. I'm really uh, excited to see everybody. Um, we're excited to be hosting this discussion. We just wish we could have been doing it in person. Um, hopefully, at some point, maybe we'll get the chance to do that. Um, if you're here, you probably know that the pilots uh, spent the last few weeks publishing the first wave of our Dividing Lines project, um, exploring racial segregation, past and present in the city of Norfolk. Um, the, the, the first sort of swath of the project has been to, to give a bird's eye view of the city and how it's divided and digging into some of the history of how the city became segregated by race. And uh, we've also looked at contemporary issues about how the schools were resegregated. Um, and uh, the most recent story was about uh, where folks are ending up with uh, vouchers and where, and where folks are ending up as they're moving out of public housing um, related to the St. Paul's redevelopment. Um, a lot of what we've done so far has been pretty high level. Uh, and, and you know, the first set of stories was really meant to open up the conversation about how the city looks, um, you know, establish sort of a shared history. And, you know, then the, the plan was always to open ourselves up to the community and, uh, you know, help get, get your help directing us to where we should be looking next, what we should be focusing our attention on going forward, you know, what stories uh, there are to tell, because we know there's a lot of them out there. Um, there's tons of history we haven't gotten to. Uh, you know, there's a lot of contemporary issues that we haven't touched on yet. Um, and there's just a lot, of, a lot of things going on, a lot of stories that people have that we don't know. And that's, that's why we're here. And that's why we hope you're here. Uh, we don't really have a lecture planned or anything. Uh, stories speak for themselves. Um, if you haven't read them all or, or you, you missed one or want to go back and look at them, they're all online at uh, pilotonline.com slash projects slash dividing dash lines. I'll put that link in the chat uh, in a second. Um, obviously, we're happy to take any questions about our stories, our reporting, um, but we really want this to be an open community discussion. Um, we want you to tell your stories. We want you to share your experiences. Uh, we want to ask, you know, hear your questions. Uh, we want you to tell us what we should be looking at. Um, so, so uh, I'm Ryan Murphy. Sorry, I haven't introduced myself yet. I'm a reporter from the pilot. I cover the city hall in Norfolk. Um, my reporting partner, Sarah Gregory is here. Uh, she covers the, the schools in the city of Norfolk. Um, and uh, our editor, Eric Hartley is on as well. He's going to be helping us uh, keep this program running smoothly. Um, We've also uh, joining us is Johnny Finn. He's a associate professor of geography and a researcher at Christopher Newport University. Um, he studied racial geography in the region and he helped us develop the maps and some of the analysis for this project. Um, his own project, the Living Together, Living Apart, uh, helped provide a lot of the inspiration to tackle this. Um, if, you, if you haven't seen that, you should check it out. Um, it, it's more regional in scope than what we've been doing. Uh, but if you've got questions about maps or history or some of the analysis, uh, Johnny's here to, to speak to that. Um, anyway, uh, like I said earlier, we're here more to listen than to talk. Um, we wanna take your questions. Uh, those of you from Norfolk, welcome. Those of you who aren't from Norfolk, uh, welcome. Uh, you know, we're taking questions and comments from anybody. Um, Sarah is gonna run down a few things and then we're gonna go ahead and get into the discussion. Hi everyone. So um, I'm Sarah Gregory. Like uh, Ryan said, I cover schools for the pilot. Um, so I just wanted to go through a few housekeeping matters. Um, you are muted upon entry just for sort of ease of uh, discussion over Zoom. But um, if you have something you'd like to say or have a question that you would like to ask one of us or ask Johnny, um, just uh, type that note in the chat on Zoom. Um, I also just wanted to um, let you know uh, if, if you're not comfortable talking in front of a large group, that's totally fine. Um, and uh, we would love to hear from you, uh, you know, one on one. Um, feel free to uh, email me or Ryan. Uh, my email is Sarah, S A R A, dot Gregory at pilotonline.com, and Ryan's is Ryan dot Murphy at pilotonline.com. And we'll post those in the chat as well and sort of remind you throughout the conversation. But um, you know, like Ryan said, this is just the start of the conversation and we hope to be um, having many more conversations around this topic in the coming weeks and months and um, welcome any input you can give us. So with that, um, 
I'd like to sort of open it up to any questions or um, any experiences that people want to share of their own uh, living in Norfolk. And I'll address, uh, as uh, Ryan and Sarah said, I'm Eric Hartley, um, one of the, the editor, uh, lead editor on this project. And <clears throat> somebody asked the question of whether the Zoom recording will be publicly available later. Um, we will uh, make that available. And so we will uh, we'll figure out a, uh, a way to communicate that to folks and, and uh, post that on our website. So so folks uh, who do want to go back uh, and look at it can, or those who couldn't make it tonight, but are interested in watching the discussion. So we will uh, we will be planning to do that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, everyone's welcome to, uh, you know, put some questions or comments in the, in the chat. Um, as, uh, as Ryan said, uh, you know, we're going to keep folks muted because of course <laughs> it gets to be a mess with 75 people unmuted. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll unmute folks as, uh, as they have something to say. Um, and so, uh, you know, if anyone wants to uh, kick us off, feel free and we'll, um, we'll keep an eye on the chat and uh, recognize, uh, recognize folks. So uh, Brad uh, raised a question in the chat about uh, lives in South Norfolk and Chesapeake and has a question about the, the geographic boundaries of the project and what we're going to be focusing on. Um, we could uh, unmute Brad if, uh, if we want to do that. Sorry, so folks might be having trouble hearing me. Sorry, it might be my... Uh, no, um, my, my question is kind of because it, when you get up to the line next to Chesapeake, a lot of the areas being born and raised in Norfolk, I kind of understand that that Berkeley area that kind of butts up against that Chesapeake area. What I've always seen like almost 40 years living in the area is a lot of times when these redevelopment projects happen in Norfolk, like um, used to be growing up East Ocean View was East Ocean View. It was, you know, moderate low income housing. Then it became East Beach. Well, people needed somewhere to go. And it wasn't always, you know, like I know there's a voucher system you discussed and stuff like that, but some of the surrounding areas is kind of way I'd be interested in looking at kind of the border, the borderlands of the two cities or, or if you were interested in that, because some of the, you know, some of the issues, the social issues that happen or, or dealt with in Norfolk inevitably have to cross that border. And, you know, I think I saw you know, Alexander in the chat, but we don't see Rick West here, but it's still, you know, kind of, that's the kind of thing I'd be interested in the pilot focusing on is really that border area. Um, thanks, Brad. I'll, I'll just say, so, uh, you know, our, our the, this, this opening sort of salvo of the project has been really focused on Norfolk in, in part to, you know, allow us to get our arms around it, right, you know. To, to try to do something region wide would be a much broader scope and and you know it, it wouldn't let us dig as deep as, as we we are hoping to and, and we have in some of these stories uh, but but yeah there's there's a lot of stories to tell and telling the story of how Norfolk got to look the way it does uh, would be incomplete without you know at least delving into some of the surrounding areas you know how Virginia Beach and Chesapeake became cities in the first place you know there, there's a ton of stories there. Um, and yeah, I, so I'm I'm born and raised in Chesapeake, and I'm very familiar with the the you know the South Norfolk area, and you know where it butts up against Berkeley and Camp Stella, and you know that's a very thin line, right? It, you know it doesn't often feel like there's much of a city line there, and so I get that. Um, that's a good good note, and I'll uh, you know I'll, I'll I'll make a note to take a sort of special look at South Norfolk as we're as we're moving forward with the project. Uh, thank you, Brad. I just wanted to say thank you to Brad as well. Um, I know one of the things that's come up as I've been researching school segregation um, is uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of researchers have looked at whether or not segregation is caused by decisions made within districts or just because of the geography of where they're from. And so there actually were a group of VCU uh, researchers who looked into this and found that. Um, you know, 50% of the segregation in Norfolk schools could be attributed to the way um, 
Norfolk and the Norfolk School Board and the, the district have designed their school boundaries, but 50% of it has to do with the geography of the larger Hampton Roads area. And I think that's like a really good example of how you can't just split apart these two things. They're, they are very connected, but like Ryan said, we did want to uh, focus, um, start with Norfolk and then expand out. And you know, one of the things I'll, I'll note as you know, the editor who's, who's been working with Ryan and uh, Sarah on this is that um, you know uh, these issues are obviously applicable in many parts of the region as well as across the country. One of the reasons that we have um, you know the, the, for the timing of this project uh, news hook, as we as we say in, in journalism, sometimes is the uh, St. Paul's redevelopment project in particular. Um, that's not the only reason this is uh, noteworthy now, but um, that is a big driver because, you know, as we've written, uh, and any of you who've, who've read the, the stories uh, know, um, that's part of the reason we're doing this, you know, that the city is embarking on this massive redevelopment project, and we want to take a look at, you know, uh, how it's going to work and the, and the pitfalls and challenges um, as that moves forward. So that is partly an answer, you know, agreeing with everything you all have said that, that we should and will focus on uh, other parts of the region. Um, but the, that is sort of the reason for, for focusing on Norfolk in particular, because uh, a redevelopment that ambitious is not uh, happening in other, in other cities. There was a quick question about what we mean by geography of the area. And by that, I just simply meant, um, you know, where the city lines are drawn, um, I guess not the physical geography, but um, sort of the um, what has, uh, wh where, where the cities are and where the lines are drawn. So. Um. I think uh, uh, Rodney Jordan, uh, who is a uh, Norfolk School Board member, uh, has his hand up in, in the chat here, so we can. Uh, can uh, him. Good evening. Uh, thanks for having this forum, and thank you for uh, for the work that you've been doing. Uh, as someone who does sit on the school board and previously sat on the Housing Authority board and been in, involved with other policy making bodies, uh, I'd just like to say that in part, what I think is important about your series is, in my experience, um, I haven't found that, that policy makers always are aware of the history and the, the history as it has uh, occurred over generations uh, just kind of becomes locked in. And uh, like in your recent story uh, that was dealing with the concept of housing choice, I can remember being in plenty of conversations, uh, both on the Housing Authority Board, I think I see a couple of folks that were there with me at one time, and on the school board, and we would have uh, conversations about uh, the belief that certain patterns just existed by, by individual choice, not necessarily by uh, government action. Uh, even as uh, one of the other speakers was uh, talking earlier and he was talking about East Ocean View and East Beach. So some think of East Ocean View, East Ocean View and East Beach. What I think of is uh, when my mother used to take me to City Beach when I was very young and because City Beach was the segregated beach where Blacks in Norfolk could go to the beach. And so when we, when we do projects, redevelopment projects, and sometimes we we lose that history and lose that understanding, then I think when we make uh, policy decisions, we don't always appreciate the, the impact, uh, or we just may not generally understand how choice is often determined by, by government action. So I'm thankful uh, for the story. I uh, also saw that Vivian Page is on and uh, you know, I had the pleasure of working with her and others when uh, she and others founded Norfolk United Face and Race. And so it's often been these efforts at trying to have these uh, conversations, but oftentimes the conversation is not held at the, at the policy table, it's held in the community. And, but then when it's time for the policymakers to have the courage to have the conversation, we often shy away from it. At least that's been my experience 
over the last 20 years or so. Thank you. Um, thanks, Rodney. Uh, and oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Good. Oh, I was I was just going to say, um, you know, you talk about uh, choice, and you know, the 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 this, these discussions that were centered around individual choice, where you know you you were saying there was less of an emphasis on this the 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 role of government in that choice, um, which is true. And and you know, anybody who hasn't read that most recent story that we put out, um, that you know that 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 so it's sort of the central theme of that story. Um, but I'll also note for, for that purpose, it's not just government, right? You know, there's a lot of other actors in the, in the you know, it, that story was specifically focused on housing. And so there's a lot of other actors in that sphere who are making decisions that, that are, are sort of driving that choice or lack thereof. Um, you know, there's a lot of research on how landlords are, you know, private landlords are, are or aren't, you know, accepting certain forms of, subsidy and things like that. Um, so there's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a many tendrilled sort of thing. There's a lot of variables that go into, you know, all of what we've written about all, you know, the, the lines that keep us divided are not, you know, they're not set in stone. Some of them aren't visible, but it's, you know, it's, there's a lot of, you know, different sort of uh, hands in, in the pot on, on that. So thanks, Rodney. Um, uh, I, uh, for those who <laughs> complained that I was hard to hear, I've, I've taken out my Bluetooth headphone. So hopefully that'll help. Um, I'm trying to recognize folks who are raising their hands and putting comments in the chat and, and, uh, hopefully I'm getting folks in order. Apologies if, uh, someone's had their hand up and I haven't noticed it. Um, I think Paul Davis, uh, had his hand up and we can, uh, hear from him next. Hi, hi everybody. Paul Davis for candidate for governor for the Republican nomination of Virginia. Y'all were talking about stories, and this is totally related. The reason my campaign even exists is divided lines. So the story goes that in the, when the interstate was built, I lived right on the interstate. My grandfather purchased the land, and the maps are now incorrect because of that project. That's You'll see my case coming out very soon. This is why I'm running the corruption in Virginia. The maps are skewed, guys. Pete Rhoda, who is the maps. Uh, engineer for the city of Norfolk. I have a letter on his letterhead from the city of Norfolk that um, they admit that I'm right, that they made a mistake. They didn't find a deed of correction case in 1956 when they developed the new GIS map system. And these maps are incorrect. And so the letter from the city of Norfolk letterhead says so. So as a concern about gerrymandering, I am definitely as your next governor very concerned about these maps and these divided lines and of course the great history of Virginia. And so we certainly appreciate all of this, you know, what you're doing. I want to contract con again, thank Virginia pilot for doing this and you guys for putting this together, you know, things like this, you know, I wouldn't exist. Paul Davis for governor wouldn't exist if it wasn't for divided lines, the maps are wrong. We've got to get them right. It's important to Virginia, it's important to the voters that their districts be right. And so, you know, I wanna just take the time to thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for this ability for all of us to reach out and uh, congratulations on, on this because this is one of the important things that the Virginia pilot can do for the community. And we as members of the community, I certainly wanna speak for the community and say, thank you for this opportunity to speak out because as you'll find out in court, y'all will follow my case, I'm sure. But as you'll find out, and sometimes as I look, I'm looking to the back where the interstate is. Um, they they took my they changed the maps to reflect an application, a financial plan, original financial plan. Okay, Paul, I think we need to to move on uh, to to some other folks, but thank you for. Uh... Your, your comments. Uh, I think we had uh, Maureen Maroney had uh, had a question about schools. Hey, right, one second. I got to scroll through some names here. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys, for being in here. Um, all right, here we go. Thank you so much. All right, Maureen, if you uh, are still there. I'm here. Right. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm 
happened to be uh, 76 years old. I grew up in Norfolk. I was in second grade at St. Mary's Academy uh, when Tidewater Gardens was having the, um, they were telephone poles, they were hitting into the ground. Uh, so I was listening to them before uh, the Tidewater Gardens was built. And, um, and uh, Church Street was alive and it was, uh, it was the black community very much um, populated by professionals as well as middle-class uh, African-American families. Um, I grew up, uh, things changed radically in Norfolk. Now that I'm old and I'm retired from Jay Cox Elementary School, which is in Burrard Park, uh, I was the counselor there for 20 years. I stayed for 20 years in one place because I'm white and I wanted to serve the community that came to Jay Cox. And 99.9% .9 of the children at Jay Cox are African-American. The uh, integration in our city is not existent. It's, it's unbelievable. Anyway, the, what the point I wanted to make was I just think what you're doing, Sarah, uh, uh, is, is awesome. And I hope you continue because the truth has to surface the children. I also, I tutor now that I've retired, I've been tutoring for the last 10 years at Jay Cox in the morning. I tutor reading to kindergartners. Um, I have 24 kids at Jay Cox in the morning, 24 kids at Little Creek, which is where I live by um, a Little Creek Road, you know, the upper part of the city. Um, and Little Creek is, is integrated in a beautiful way. The kids that I serve have uh, Spanish speaking in the home, African-American children and some white kids that need a little help from uh, their parents and they're not getting it. But so I go from one school to the other. I go to Jay Cox in the morning and Little Creek in the afternoon and Little Creek is not integrated 50-50, but at least those kids, they couldn't care if you were purple. They are friends and it is a beautiful thing. And at Jay Cox, they don't know the difference because everybody's African-American. We got to change that. It's better for the kids at Little Creek, much better. The kids at Jay Cox are getting the best we can give them, but because of where they live, everybody comes from the same neighborhood, which is St. Paul's. Thank you so much, Maureen, for sharing. Um, I, I think I might follow up with you after because it sounds like you have a wealth of knowledge um, from having worked in the district for so long. Um, and uh, continue to volunteer. So I, I'd love to talk with you more. Um, I think we had uh, Jordan Brown has had his hand up and uh, we could uh, go to him next. Honestly, I wasn't next. Paul Bagley was. Oh, was okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, we, we can go to Paul first and then uh, Jordan, that's fine. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, you said my name right. I love you. Um, <laughs> So um, I've been reading a lot about Chicago and the diaspora of the African-American community out of the city. I think it's 300,000 since 2000. And my friends are saying that, you know, the, the mix of the elementary schools are, are changing. My question to you and your analysis, are you able to find out what the mix was in these neighborhoods um, at the beginning of your analysis and now? Is, is that available and is that part of your um, studies? Thanks. Ryan, do you want to answer this one? I'm, I'm not okay. I'm not sure where Ryan went, but uh, yeah, I mean, so we've been looking at um, basically census track data. Um, that's one of the things that Johnny has been helping us, and we um, have. Uh, looked at census data going back to 1910. That's the earliest year that it's really um, digitized and like easily accessible. And so um, that's one of the things that we've spent a lot of time um, looking at. And it is um, really fascinating to look at, you know, what the maps look like in 1910 versus 1920 and 1930. Um, because in the 1910s, you start seeing some of the city's uh, racist 
uh, housing policies start to first be implemented. And um, so before then, it, the city was described as like this keyboard of homes with like black and white uh, families living side by side. And then after, you know, 1914 or so, you start seeing um, neighborhoods that were previously fairly integrated becoming either predominantly black or predominantly white. And so that's definitely something we've been looking at and um, something that um, we plan on looking at more um, because it, it does tell a lot of the story and it does, um, you can sort of see the cause and effect of different uh, policies on the city. Um, I think Johnny might have uh, an, a comment on uh, on this issue as well. Yeah. Hey, everyone. It's 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 lovely to chat with you all. Um, so I've been doing a lot of the data and mapping um, for this project, and the question that was brought up was was is a really interesting question of how you kind of measure segregation quantitatively and how you compare it from year to year to know if segregation is increasing or decreasing. And I'm, I'm currently in the process of doing a, a pretty wide kind of analysis of this. And it, I think it's worth just thinking through what we mean when we, when we say like, it's more segregated now, it's less segregated now. And so just on a broad scale and to take a, a bunch of quality, quantitative analysis, data analysis down in, into like a 15 or 30 second uh, um, a piece of piece of information. What we're looking at is basically Norfolk is today is about forty three percent white, about forty one percent black, and the 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 other sixteen or so percent is the combination of all other races and ethnicities in the city. So the 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 city is actually quite diverse at the at the scale of the city. But any block, any neighborhood, is tends to be much more. Uh, homogeneous. It's much whiter or much blacker uh, at the at the scale of the individual blocks. So the way that we quantitatively measure this and map this out is basically by looking at the differential between the overall mixture of the or the over, the overall racial diversity of the city versus the racial diversity of an individual block or an individual neighborhood. And that's how you can kind of quant quantitatively measure. Uh, segregation. And that's how you can use census data going back reliably back in the case of Norfolk to 1950. And back past 1950, it gets a little hairy because all the census records are handwritten. And so there's a lot of kind of uh, noise in the in the data in the census records. Um, but you can see that the, the lines of segregation have, have, have really hardened uh, up until 2010. And then in 2020, now it's been postponed, but by September, we should be receiving the block level data from the 2020 census that is a far more reliable source at that refined block level scale than the inter 10 year, um, like the 2018 data that we relied on for the stories is, is based on a survey rather than a census. And so when later this year, when we have the, the, the block level data from the US census, um, on the entire population of the US, we'll be able to really do a, a, a nice robust calculation of the change between 2010 and now 2020. And on this, on the, on the, on the, in the stories, you can see this going all the way back, like Sarah said, to 1910. Um, thanks, uh, Johnny, and uh, thanks for the question. Um, I think um, maybe we'll go to, to Jordan uh, Brown next. Um, who kindly uh, <laughs> deferred to someone who uh, had their hand raised before him. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first and foremost, thank you guys for putting this on. This is great. Uh, my name is Jordan Brown. As I said, I'm the director of a nonprofit called the Urban Renewal Center based out of Norfolk. I technically live in Suffolk, uh, but Norfolk does have a big part of my heart. And so it's really awesome to see this. Um, I don't have uh, much of a question really, and more so just commentary in the moment, especially for Johnny. We've worked with Johnny before on a couple of projects. We intend to snag him to work on more projects again real soon. So uh, uh, just, he's awesome. He's definitely the best. Um, but uh, if anything, I just wanted to, to say, uh, it is very interesting to note um, all of the things that you guys are having a conversation about are some of the things that we're really trying to bring to light. Uh, one of the aims of our organization is to tell the story of the history of Norfolk so that it's not doomed to repeat it. And uh, that's as, as sad as saying that, you know, you we're looking at historical context of things that happened in the 1940s and 50s. I'm thinking 1997 when MacArthur Mall came up. 
um, and, and the displacement that happened then. So, you know, I just, uh, I want to say, uh, just to be really, really brief, uh, I appreciate the fact that you guys have started this project. Um, and we're hoping to really kind of tagline some of this stuff and maybe even give you guys some features now that you need it because you're the Virginia pilot. God bless you. But, um, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's something that you haven't said, um, but it goes without saying uh, the, the history of the city of Norfolk is, is one that is very ahistoric. Um, and, and the problem with that is uh, the way that people are trying to charge ahead now with the St. Paul's project is it's, it's very myopic. So they're cutting off the history of the past and they're not bothering to look at the trajectory of what's going to, what this is going to do in the future. Um, and they're both the same thing. Uh, and so, you know, we, we've discussed things like, uh, education, <clears throat> um, and, and, and in particular right now, we're talking homelessness with the Urban Renewal Center because we partnered with NEST, the Norfolk Emergency Shelter Team. Um, and we have taken in 45 to 55 homeless guests every single night. Um, and, and there's a lot that, you know, the city has to take accountability for concerning why those individuals are homeless as well. Um, and so, you know, when, when it comes down to it, I think that uh, the biggest piece concerning the divided lines and, and uh, urban segregation in general, uh, but, you know, definitely segregation concerning the city of Norfolk is that it's, it's, it's really disrespectful. It's about a slap in the face to see how it is literally just kind of waved in front of your face. And, you know, especially in Ghent specifically, it's, 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 it's incredible to me how you can go down Colonial Avenue and in the span of one minute go from a place where you see like the Handsome Biscuit and brand new, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, buildings and things of that nature and then be right across the street from, um, was the United Methodist Church that just shut down over there um, and just see, you know, all of the subsidized housing and all this, uh, this stuff and just wonder how that came to be. And then more importantly, why people are okay with it um, because I'm pretty sure that they can't be, but again, you know, just a, a little bit of commentary, but really, really appreciating the fact that you guys are having this conversation, please keep it going. Um, and anything that we can do, hopefully we'll be able to partner up and make some things happen. I think. Um, thank you, Jordan. Uh, it's important to note, you know, and I think we've we've been trying to we've tried to be eyes wide open about this and starting this project. We're not, you know, treading new ground with this, right? This is well documented. You know, there are many there there are several really good books written specifically about Norfolk. There's plenty of scholarship about it. But you're right when you say, you know, there is an ahistorical sort of uh, regard, I think, for for the city. You know, I grew up around here. Um, before I started digging into this for, you know, for my background as a reporter of, North, you know, I wasn't always the, the city hall reporter in Norfolk, right? I grew up in Chesapeake, but until I started digging into it for my job, I was woefully, you know, ignorant of, you know, the history of the area of what went into developing certain neighborhoods, you know, what those stories were. And, and a big part of why we've wanted to do this project has been to, you know, like I said earlier, the, the, this first wave of the project was really to try to get sort of a, a shared understanding of the history, you know, at a baseline, right? Um, so yeah, the point well taken. There's, there's, you know, this, this is, this is not new territory, but it's something that people need to, you know, people either don't know, never exposed to, or need to be reminded of. Um, Sarah, do you want to uh, welcome folks who might have just joined us and uh, sort of recap uh, some of the, <laughs> the logistics and how we're doing things? Yeah, if, if you're just joining us, if you've just logged in, um, you'll notice that you've been um, muted. If you have something that you'd like to say or a question, um, pop it in the chat or raise your hand. Um, we're, we're trying to watch for those and call folks in order. Um, if we miss someone, we're sorry. Uh, just try and flag our attention. Uh, we are recording this um, so that it'll be available later if you want to go back to it or uh, for folks who couldn't make it tonight. But um, I'm here. I'm one of the reporters on uh, who's been working on this project. I cover schools for the pilot and I'm joined by my colleague Ryan Murphy, uh, who covers the city and our editor, uh, Eric Hartley, who's uh, you'll hear from time to time moderating. So um, that's all. Thank you. Uh, yeah, if we want to go, I, I believe uh, Sharon McGlone was one of the folks who had uh, her, her hand up or had a question.
No, I don't have a question now. I may later, but I didn't oh. have Okay, sorry, I, I misunderstood. I thought you had to raise a question or had your hand up. Uh, I think we had uh, Judith Brown uh, had a question or had her hand up. Yes, I do have a question and it's about trailers and trailer parks. Um, do we have trailers in Norfolk? Do we have trailer parks? Are trailers likely to be the solution or another problem? Um, as we go forward here. Um, so I haven't researched this. Uh, it just in knowing the city a little bit, I, I'm not familiar with any meaningful number or concentration of trailers or, or trailer park. Um, uh, and I'm not exactly sure what you mean by could trailers be the solution to this, but um, you know, I am we are, you know, hoping to, to do some more solution oriented stories in the future, uh, exploring what might be solutions to some of this. Um, and so, you know, I'll, I'll make a note to, to, to see if there's any research related to, you know, mobile home usage. Thank you. All right. Um, Paul, uh, you had your hand up and you were raising your physical hand. I was watching on video. I know you're trying very hard to, uh, to get us to, to listen. So I'm going to unmute you if you want to ask your question. Uh, Paul, you have to, uh, you have to um, unmute yourself. I've, I've asked you to unmute. There you go. Hey, Paul, I still can't, you still, you're still muted. You might have to unmute yourself on your screen and sorry for everybody else. I'm just, I want to make sure Paul gets his is uh, his time to uh, speak. All right, Paul, we're gonna have to move on. I'm sorry. Um, can you hear me now? I can hear you, thank you. Sorry, go ahead. Well, my name is Paul Scholart and uh, I was, I guess uh, the best place I can put it is I was Johnny for a number of years uh, here in the Norfolk area. Uh, I did lots of work with census material, worked for the Planning District Commission, as well as uh, most of the uh, political localities. And um, I was here from 1976 until 1993. And I moved on to uh, Illinois State University, serve as a dean. Uh, one thing that I haven't heard yet, but was a very important uh, part of the conversation on the schools and race and uh, the work that uh, Sarah and, uh, excuse me, have done. Uh, but uh, the one piece that uh, I didn't hear is about uh, school busing and particularly school busing with respect to uh, white flight. Uh, the school board, uh, when they made a decision to get out of the school uh, segregation or out of the, to get out of the busing business by challenging uh, the court decision that was based on Brown versus Board of Ed. Board of Ed. So we had this uh, badly split city and the white interests uh, and the majority of the school board was uh, mostly white at that point. Uh, and we got into questions of white flight uh, or economic flight. Uh, and so it was an interesting piece of the thing. And I've, I've enjoyed very much the work to date. I wanna hear more because uh, I did have uh, the fortune, good fortune, bad fortune of living through most of it and being, being involved with an awful lot of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, we definitely plan on getting into uh, the sort of white flight um, history of this. Uh, one of the things that uh, one of my recent stories touched on was looking at that decision to end busing. And, and the city started with elementary school busing in the 80s and then ended middle school busing in the early 2000s and actually was uh, the first city in the country to be uh, declared um, 
yeah, a unitary, which meant that there was a, on paper officially no uh, segregation between the schools. And um, what what's fascinating to what's been fascinating to me, I think, when I've like looked at the research, is that it. it as those decisions were happening, they did seem to be driven a lot by fears of white flight to the suburbs. And if you look at like what's happening in the suburbs at that time, I mean, there's a, a lot of new construction and a lot of new housing. And, and so what folks who have like, what research who, researchers who have looked back on this, and I'm sure you know all about this, but um, we plan to definitely explore this more, but it wasn't just uh, white families who were leaving Norfolk, it was middle-class black families as well and um, leaving at pretty equal numbers. So it was, um, it, it was happening on, uh, you know, it wasn't just white families who were leaving, but uh, definitely um, something that uh, we plan to get into more because, uh, you know, if I, when I talk to people now about schools, uh, folks who have grown up in Norfolk, I mean, they remember busing and they remember, um, those those arguments and the conversations and debates in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. So, I I believe uh, Audra had a question. Um, if we want to uh, recognize her, I just um, was looking. I went when I, when the first article came out. I love maps, <laughs> and I so Johnny, um, I love these maps, but. I'm wondering if I'm reading them wrong because it actually looks more colorful the the 2018 than the 2010s or the, than the 1910. So I'm wondering what I'm seeing differently than than the conclusion that the it was more a piano keyboard. And I understand that you're dealing with very different population size from 1910 till now. Yeah, yeah, so Johnny, go ahead. thank you. Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, and Audra, thank you so much for that question. Part of the problem is a part of what you're seeing is a problem in the data that since the 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 shape of the neighborhoods that the census draws on the map change over time. And back before 1950, the data becomes it is what we have are handwritten scans of data that have to be re-digitized or digitized for the first time. So anything before 1950, broadly for the entire entirety of the US, it gets a little bit fuzzier and the, and the, the, the refinement of the geographic scale of the data gets larger. And so if you look, starting in the 1950, in 1950 in the map of Norfolk, we're looking at census tracts. And those census tracts stay pretty constant, though they change shape a little bit all the way up to 1980. And then in the maps that we produced, it goes down to the block group. So it's a collection of several five, six, seven, eight blocks all collected together as a block group. But when you get back before 1950, so in the 1940, back to all the way back to 1910, the, the, they're using what are called enumeration districts, which basically are like the areas that a single census worker can access on foot walking around and knocking on doors and, and collecting the census data. And so the data is just a little bit less precise moving back in before 1950. And at the same time, it, like, and so what, you, and, and again, the, the most important thing to look at is not so much the, the, the extent of where there are, and those maps were rating the neighborhoods by the percentage of the, of the neighborhood, whether it's large or small, the percentage of that neighborhood that self-reports as being black or African-American. And so the darker color uh, in the darker color, kind of the shade of purple that we used in the map is higher percentage of African-American. And we cut off, we, we set the cutoffs at 90% and 10%. So 90% or higher, which is a really high, like very, very homogeneously African-American neighborhood on the one end, or the very, the kind of the very, the very other extreme is 10% or less African-American, meaning 90% or more white on the other end. And so it, the maps, they like, there, there's some issues there, but when you map it, when you actually run the statistics, when you actually run the data on it, 
um, we see that there hasn't been a whole lot of movement in terms of kind of the, these different measures of quantitative measures of segregation. There hasn't been a whole lot of movement. In fact, it's gone mostly through the 20th century. It's been an increasing level of segregation at the neighborhood level rather than a decreasing. And again, like I said before, I'm, we're just waiting for the maps and or for the census data to come out from the 2020 census to run these analysis again to see kind of the update of that uh, into the, the present day. Sorry, that was a, a bit of a long answer. I appreciate your patience with me. I think uh, Vicki Greco uh, had uh, her hand up or a question. Hi, everybody. Yes, um, I remember being a student at Chesterfield Heights Elementary, being bused there in 70, and then in 76, I went to my neighborhood school at Little Creek Elementary. My question actually is refers back to something Ryan said earlier, the actors in the housing um, industry. I was uh, the Community Reinvestment Act officer in pre-Katrina New Orleans for Hibernian National Bank. It's now um, Capital One, but I've always been interested in my hometown's um, history, the lending history of um, our, our financial institutions um, and, and how we can, how it, the red line is actually documented. Um, I know as a, as a banker in a previous life, we looked at block level data um, to look at the low moderate income census tracts where we could um, actually uh, target um, some redevelopment by uh, putting on first time home buyer series, uh, education workshops. And I wanna know what our banks are doing now to not only um, comply with the law, the CRA of 1977, there'll be some updates, especially with the Biden administration, but I wanna know what they've done in the past and what um, they might be, what the banks are, especially with bb and and, Tr and SunTrust now, Truist, what are they doing to comply with CRA and get the good grades? I know that sometimes um, that uh, the subprime lending, um, they, Lenders want to blame the CRA for, for those transgressions, but it's actually uh, compliance and true commitment to reinvestment in, in all neighborhoods where um, the, the banks are taking um, retail deposits. So I guess just to wind back, I, I was wondering if Johnny would even have um, that kind of data of what loans are made um, what mortgages were made in in low income census tracts or the African American census tracts versus the white census tracts? So, oh, Ryan, do you want to go ahead? No, well, you can answer that question first. Go ahead. No, so so I mean, the data that I I don't know of major kind of data dumps, so to speak, that we can uh, gather from banks on on the actual mortgages. What we can look at is the kind of the combination of two things. One is the data that's coming in at the census track or census black group level of ownership, home ownership or owner occupied residences versus renter residences. And then we can kind of parse that out with the fact that, for example, many of the big banks, big, big mortgage lenders, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, have, have recently, just in the last couple of years, settled major hundreds hundreds of millions of dollars class action lawsuits for discriminatory lending practices where they're giving subprime loans to people of color um, who equally qualify for prime loans um, but because of their race or because of the neighborhood they're, they're trying to buy in are offered significantly higher interest rates and as a result of significantly higher interest rates the loan is more expensive, which means that the, the, the cap on the home value that they can purchase is lower, forcing them, forcing non-white potential home buyers into lower uh, home value neighborhoods, thus perpetuating both racial segregation on the one hand, and also perpetuating the, the ongoing um, kind of expanding racialized uh, wealth gap because most the most Americans' wealth is in the one home that they own uh, and live in, and so by these pra these discriminatory practices by banking that but by banks that continue into the present day, are pushing non-white home buyers into higher interest rate higher interest rate loans and thus lower home value neighborhoods. 
and exacerbating the problem. As for data, specifically at the kind of the block level of interest rates and home value and, and home prices, uh, I, I mean, I think we'd have to pay the folks at Zillow a lot of money to get a hand or to get our hands on that. Um, but it would be it would be it would make for a tremendous analysis, wouldn't it? Uh, and I'll just piggyback on that by saying, uh, I don't know a ton about the banking structure. Uh, and I, obviously I don't know nearly in, as much about the data as Johnny does. Um, but that is obviously an important sort of part of, if we're looking at this overall housing ecosystem, the banks are a big part of it, right? Um, and Vicki, at some point later, I'd love to pick your brain a little bit more about, you know, what you see and what you think we should be looking at with that. All right. Um, let's see who was next. Uh, Christine. Let's see. Let me see if I can find you real quick. All right. I don't see a Christine. I see a Christina, but that's not the same person, right? I'm going to skip that. Um, Dawn. All right. Dawn, you should be uh, unmuted. Yes, or... I think so now, right? Yes. Yeah. Hi. So I just wanted to, I had made a comment earlier when we were uh, discussing schools and all that. Uh, I had the opportunity to send my daughter to the STEM Academy when it first opened. And um, and so we, we chose that. We lived downtown, uh, decided to send her there. And I'm through Mr. Jordan. I think I saw Ms. Bassine on here as well from the school board will remember that a lot of parents pulled out of that when uh, the decision was made that it would be, a, um, I guess, a neighborhood school, right? So the kids from the neighborhood would come in. And I think about half the parents who had applied to that school um, pulled out of there. We decided not to. And I think it was one of the best decisions um, personally that we made for my family, for myself, because it gave me an opportunity to meet people that I probably would never really spend a lot of time with in Norfolk. And it really highlighted for me how we are clustered in our neighborhoods. And so we talk about Norfolk, but we're really, I, sometimes I feel like we're not Norfolk, we're Ghent. You know, we're, we're downtown, we're Campus Stella, um, we're Park Place, we're not Norfolk. Uh, one of my things is how do we get a better opportunity to talk and meet with one another because that's how we understand each other. Um, it, it really opened my eyes, even though, you know, I was a lawyer, I did employment discrimination. So I dealt with a lot of the stuff on the legal side, but I, I met with the parents. I, I was part of a parent group. And one thing I realized was these parents are involved and engaged in all the things that I had heard about parents and, and kids from public housing weren't necessarily true. I mean, they had uh, struggles and things and had to deal with stuff that I don't have to deal with. But um, to me, we in our neighborhood, in, in, in our neighborhood being our city, need to really understand and that's the way we could help each other. Uh, for example, one day, one of the mothers was like, okay, I've got to leave the meeting because I have to catch the bus because I have to get to Virginia Beach to get some paperwork to come back to apply for assistance for heat. And, and she's like, I don't even know if the bus goes all the way where I need to go in Virginia Beach. And it, it just really opened my eyes to we don't pay attention to how hard we make it for people. And then we complain when, you know, we say, oh, well, the parents aren't involved enough. And now I'm a teacher and I know parents try really hard to be involved, but they have a lot going on. And we as a city, especially I think um, when we don't have to deal with those problems, I have a car, I don't have to worry about the bus schedule and all. So that uh, really helped me to understand and engage and to, um, we're just all people and we really need to treat each other that way yeah. and listen to the problems. Um, that we all have. I think I saw um, Mr. Pledger on here as well. I don't know if he's still on, but I've taught a couple of his students because I, I now teach at Norfolk Public Schools and I followed him on what he's doing and trying to deal with um, 
the the food issues, the the food deserts with the I think it was the save a lot that left, and that shouldn't be a neighborhood problem. That should be a city problem. Uh, but I'm not sure how do we engage everybody. I saw somebody said that there's a a podcast that people are doing talking to their neighbors. Um, but I'd love to know if other people are doing something, if there's a way we can do it on a citywide level uh, to be able to engage each other, know each other more and treat each other as a community. Thank you, Don. Uh, Sarah, Ryan or uh, Johnny? Um, so that's a big question, right? You're asking how, how, do, how do we fix this, you know, persistent division between these neighborhoods that's, you know, been, in place for so long and uh obviously there's not an easy answer to that right because if there was we somebody would have already done it uh and and i don't have a, a good answer for you now you know maybe at some point after i've done a lot more research maybe i'll have uh but but you know i think at least from our perspective at the newspaper i think we we believe our role is in encouraging exactly these kind of conversations right hopefully hopefully you know there's 125 people on this call, uh, far more than frankly we expected. Thrilled that you're all here. You know, it, you know, it, in our our role, if we can facilitate the discussion between everybody on this call about how do we fix this for our neighborhoods, maybe that gets us somewhere, right? Uh, you know, I, I unfortunately I don't I don't have an answer to to the specific question, but at least for our role, it starts here, right? And that's why we've started this project, um, and that's why we're thrilled to have all of you on here now. All right. Um, thank you so much. Um, I believe Nash, you, you've had uh, your hand up for a while. Let me uh, unmute your, allow you to unmute yourself. Did I do that? You did. Go oh, ahead. Good. Um, so I, part, I, was, um, I was on redevelopment and housing a, long, a, a few years back. And one of the things that always came true was what Ms. Sarah Gregory was talking about was the suburbs, the flight, white flight of the suburbs. And, and what she means, I think, by the suburbs is primarily Virginia Beach, um, which is, which if you're, if you're analyzing this problem and you're not addressing what happens in Virginia, you know, the, the fact that Virginia Beach was formed in 1963 right, as, as this problem was coming to the forefront and you're not analyzing Virginia Beach and you're not analyzing the fact that if you're on this side of Newtown Road, you've got to go to school in, in, uh, in the Norfolk schools. On the, if you're on the other side, you can go to all those beautiful Virginia Beach schools. And if you're doing all your analysis just in Norfolk, you're, aren't you potentially leaving out a big part of the picture, which is that Norfolk and Virginia Beach are really just one place that got separated by a political decision in the 60s. Um, but it has to be analyzed in a, as a larger sense than just Norfolk. If you're just looking at Norfolk, anyway, that's, I'm not, I'm not sure how to pose that, but I'm posing that. Thank you for the time. Th that's definitely something so, we, uh, you uh, that's definitely something gotcha. that we plan to uh, we we plan to expand our focus. So um, we've we we've started with Norfolk because that's where the St. Paul's redevelopment project is starting, and the the, the city is t undertaking this you know massive project trying to uh, reduce economic and racial segregation um, within the city. Um, but you're right, we you can't separate out um, what's happening um, not just in Virginia Beach but Chesapeake and um, you know, we, we are a, a very large metropolitan area. And so that will definitely be something that we explore more. Okay, um, next up is Paul and then uh, Levon and then Vincent Hodges. Um, you, you all have your hands up. Thank you so much. Um, Paul? Hello, um, I'm gonna put a few things together and then uh, pose it as a question. Probably Johnny's gonna be the best one to answer it. We talked about how we've had, you know, these disparities and who's been able to get loans and who hasn't, and that, you know, dates back to, you know, redlining. But then we come up to, 
now where a lot of these compliance issues still haven't been fixed and we still have these effects in forms of where we all live. And then we add into that property taxes in Virginia are one of the primary ways that schools are funded. So now we end up in a situation where a place that has high property values and his historically predominantly white have these you know up to date buildings and up to date and you know they, they are the first places that t teachers want to apply and then we have right next door divisions where you know, we we have buildings and we've had stories very recently of uh school buildings with maintenance issues has anything been done to address the school funding disparities Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, there obviously there's, um, there's, I could go on about this topic for um, a, a long time. Um, there, yeah, I mean, because of the way Virginia funds its schools, uh, a lot of uh, cities uh, get their funding. Um, a, a lot of localities, wealthier localities are able to supplement their schools funding in a way that lower income uh, cities are not able to. And um, so, yeah, th there's definitely, um, that's a dynamic at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level, um, and, and the state funding uh, tries to take into account um, a locality's ability to pay, but that, that does definitely contribute to some of the disparities. And I would love to look into that more, Paul. Can I, can I jump in and say something on that, Sarah, do you mind? Go right ahead. Because there was a comment in the chat about the history of housing segregation. And um, I teach a whole class on the history of housing segregation in the US. And uh, I'll just get right to the point. Um, racist housing policies, racist segregationist housing policies in the US uh, throughout most of the 20th century created a situation that accumulated wealth, that subsidized the accumulation of wealth in white neighborhoods. Uh, and, and especially white suburban neighborhoods while blocking African American families from accumulating wealth through housing for most of the kind of the middle section of the 20th century, starting the depression all the way out to the Fair Housing Act in 1968. And, and that that single fact uh, explains uh, the majority of the racial wealth gap in this country that's uh, that's astronomical. Uh, it's uh, white families uh, or black family, the black median uh, net worth in this country is 10% of white median net worth, according to a recent study done by the Federal, the Federal Reserve Bank. Um, white median family income is $170,000 in black, excuse me, white median wealth is $170,000 in black median family wealth is $17,000, a 90% gap that's explained exclusively by the history of racist housing policy in this country. And then it's about housing, it's about property. And then we fund our schools through property taxes and we populate our schools based on the neighborhoods that we spent most of a century segregating. And so it's no surprise that a report a couple of years ago came out that says in the US there's a year to year $23 billion gap, funding gap between schools that are predominantly white, this is nationally, between schools that are fun, predominantly white versus schools that are predominantly black, in spite of serving about the same number of students. Uh, and there's a $23 billion funding gap. And Sarah can talk to you a lot more about how there's lots of other things that go into educational outcomes and educational achievement. But if white schools that serve about the same number of black schools are getting $23 billion more per year, that probably has something to do with it. And it's all built upon the way we fund our schools on the back of a century of, of housing policy. And uh, that's all. Thanks, Johnny. <laughs> all right, thanks, Johnny. Um, okay, so Levon's next and then Vincent. Um, those are the people who have their hands up right now. If you're just joining us, I know there have been a lot of people coming in and out. Um, this meeting was scheduled to end at 8.30, but, um, uh, you know, I know there's been a lot of discussion and some some long answers, so uh, we're going to continue. Uh, I think for a little bit longer uh, after 8:30, but just FYI. Um, uh, so, uh, Levon, you're up next. Thank you for being patient. Yeah, no problem. Um, I I was about 20 minutes late because <laughs> uh, 
there was about 12 gunshots outside my door. So I was a little bit late and I apologize for that. But um, the young lady um, earlier said something about um, how do we how do we bring the neighborhoods together here in Norfolk? So um, the thing is, and then somebody else earlier kind of kind of hit the nail on the head. Um, Norfolk isn't accessible for folks um, in my neighborhood. Um, it, it physically isn't accessible. It's not socially accessible and it's not um, it's it's not civically accessible for folks like me and people in my neighborhood because uh, I mean when you are living day to day and and having that you know that issue where you do, you might not have transportation or you might not have this available at your disposal mm -hmm. and, and that's because the average income in your community is maybe less than twelve thousand dollars a year that's <laughs> that's a really big deal uh, so it makes cities like this it makes cities like this unaccessible to to people like me. So I, I can't, you know, I don't get to the grocery store at the same rate as you do. I don't have the same amount of time as you do to to have disposable time to do this or do that in the third. And it's just it it it, it creates barriers. And and what I what I truly believe that Norfolk could do is is remove some of those barriers and and desegregate Norfolk and 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 truly you know, bring communities that have been disinvested for, for years. Um, there has been no investment. I, I watched them build, you know, MacArthur Mall right up the street, you know, and, and, and people lived out here. Um, I, I've seen a lot of stuff, you know, they, they did, they started projects in Ward's Corner and didn't finish. Um, and, and now, you know, uh, they just bought a, what, a Military Circle Mall. There's so much going on. Um, economically here in Norfolk, but there's not anything really happening here and in communities like mine. And it's it's really it create it does create that barrier to be civically active. I'm probably the only person here who, who does live in public housing in this in this we have what 135 people. I'm probably the only person. And and that's because Norfolk truly isn't accessible. Uh, it's not accessible for people in in places like me. And it's 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 been built that way and it's been designed that way to 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 lock out um, people in my position from making those making decisions and having their voices heard um, and it, it's it's sad but it's true and uh, I, I really like to see things change I, I'm hopeful that even this project the St Paul's redevelopment this this project that we you know are able to address some of the faults you know that that have kind of uh, that have kind of already taken place where, you know, we didn't, we, we started to push residents out before we even, we even built anything. Not one brick has been laid yet. And we are, we've already pushed out a good 30% of the community or, or more and less than, less than, you know, 15% of that community moved into areas of opportunity because Norfolk is, is, has a gate and a key. Uh, and we have to, you know, do what we can to remove those. Thanks, Levon. I'll uh, I'll just note, uh, you know, for, to, to Don's question earlier, um, you know, I was speaking about the, the paper's role in trying to facilitate these sort of uh, discussions, but you know, th there is there's a whole sort of there there are a bunch of different government bodies that you know if, if citizens feel so inclined as to push their government to to do something there's a bunch of different uh bodies that are constantly having meetings uh that that you can attend that you can watch that you can you know be in communication with those members you know city council's a big obvious one at school board um the, the housing authorities board meets publicly um there's a bunch of subcommittees of the city that discuss different things including one that was started recently on um uh, uh, race and economic equality. Uh, there's a dedicated St. Paul's advisory board that meets. So there's a lot of if you if you're just looking to get inundated with information and and you know sort of know who the government decision makers are that are that are you know talking policy. There's a there's a, a wealth of them. Um, and you know if you're if you're really curious to know more, I can I can try to point you in the direction of where those schedules and uh, logins are to, to watch those meetings. They're all happening virtually now, but yeah. Um, you know, there, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of decision-making bodies that are, you know, 
if, if you're looking to get more active and more involved and know more about what's happening, there's a lot, a lot of discussions happening now um, at the government level. All right. Um, I'll just say, Don, really sorry, quickly, I'm sorry to cut you off, Sean, but um, you suggested uh, put it in the paper. And that's actually, um, we are, uh, we have talked about putting together a reading list and talked about putting together, um, you know, more resources. And so that is uh, on our list. It's <laughs> a good idea. All right. Um, uh, thank you so much. So uh, Vincent, you're up next as far as someone who's raised their hand. Uh, Jean, you mentioned in the comments that you're raising your hand. So I'll, um, I'll get to you after Vincent. Uh, if, if you guys have any other questions or any comments, please let us know. Raise your hand in, uh, on, the, on the inside Zoom or just let us know in the comments. Um, Vincent. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for letting me speak. And um, I wanted to say before I uh, just took up a bit of everybody's time, Mr. Pledger and Mr. Brown, uh, I travel in circles and your name comes well, names come uh, well received. I'm looking to reach out and, and work with, with powerful black men to, to take an initiative and start working on at the ground level on these issues. And uh, it came up in, in conversation a little bit ago, you know, what can we do, what can we do? You know, there are places where we can get involved and, and there's a lot of good information here, um, but the organization that I'm working with and the person that I'm working with, her name's Michelle Harrison, her organization is Impact Southside. Um, the third uh, Saturday of every month, uh, they've been doing food distributions. If anybody remembers the Harbor Park uh, Thanksgiving dis distribution, that was uh, over 2,200 cars, over 25,000 pounds of food, all handed out to families. Um, there is a way to get involved and it's hard, um, but the best way to start making communication happen, to start, um, you know, it was just mentioned like bringing participation to civic leagues, things like that. If you wanna raise civic awareness, you have to start working problems at the ground level and not the policy level. And that's what we're about. So if you wanna come and help, there's an event that's happening Saturday, at the Banks of Berkeley, 701 South Main. Um, again, that's the third Saturday of every month. The next one is March 20th. Um, come and help on the ground floor and meet the people that are affected by these policies that we've been talking about. Um, Norfolk State has a great environmental justice class that uh, put me onto this and I was so excited uh, to start reading this series. I really appreciate it, the things that I've, that I've read up to this point, the things that I'm hearing in the town hall. This needs to be amplified because people aren't doing this, you know, there are more of us that want to get out here and make this change, you know, than there are of them that want to keep the system the same. And, and there are barriers, extreme thick concrete barriers to access that people just don't understand unless you live the life that like Mr. Pleasure was talking about, you know, it is difficult. Um, I'm an active member of Black Lives Matter. We were out uh, marching for Xavier Hill a couple of Saturday nights ago and, mar and, and you know, we're going through St. Paul's and there was a gunshot that had taken place less than an hour ago. We were stopped and had a, a real conversation with a mother who had just lost uh, her son two nights before to gun violence. And this is the stuff that, that continues to be perpetuated in, the, in this for mixed income housing. It's not, it's not right, it's not right and we can do more. But I think that the most effective way if, you, if people are really sincere about getting into the communities and and opening and creating dialogue, come work with us. Um, and then last thing, there's an initiative that's getting ready to start out of the West Ghent Civic League. We're gonna approach the Ghent Civic League to approach the Ghent Business Association and ask if they can, uh, if, what we can do about getting a little bit of the revenue that goes in there sent to the St. Paul's and to the Berkeley community. Ghent now with that farmer's market will have five grocery stores. And then we're talking about an area St. Paul's, the entire St. Paul's quadrant, Berkeley, continue south all the way into Campostella. That food, that is an area of food apartheid. It's not a food desert. Deserts occur naturally. This was designed, it's food apartheid. No, you know, there's a way for people to do more than put signs in their yard and, and flags out. And, and you all are doing that work with this research, you know, 
performance activism won't cut it. Come get your hands dirty. Thanks for letting me share. All right, thank you so much. Um, uh, Sarah Ryan, uh, do you guys have anything? Um, just, you know, just like I said earlier, there's a bunch of government boards meeting. There's a ton of these, you know, ground level grassroots groups in the area um, that are working. And yeah, I mean, you'll have no shortage of them if you, if you can, you know, find them. Uh, sometimes finding them can be difficult, right? There's not a central directory of, of these groups doing this work. Um, but, uh, you know, we're, uh, it sounds like uh, there might be an appetite for us to do some sort of try to do some sort of directory or something. So I'll, I'll look at, I'll look at that um, because there is, you know, a lot, a lot of groups getting thrown around in here and, and if, if for no other reason, it's good for me to have a list of them. So why shouldn't everybody have a list of them? All right. Um, uh, so next up, if you guys have any uh, comments or, or questions you guys want to ask, please get them in the chat or, or raise your hand uh, digitally in this, in this, um, in the zoom. Uh, Gene, you're up next. Uh, I'm going to unmute you or ask you to unmute yourself. Uh, and good evening. Um, I'm really enjoying this conversation. I see some familiar faces with uh, Rodney Jordan and uh, John Kownack. We uh, worked together on some things been a few years ago. But uh, one of the things that I think, I mean, everyone's had some really great ideas. Um, but one of the things I would just like to say from my experiences of Norfolk, uh, growing up in Norfolk, uh, seeing a lot of changes from uh, the redevelopment of downtown to uh, current status. You know, when I was with the school system, and this has been something that wherever I've been, is so much of the uh, phrase, as your school system goes, so does your city. And one of the things that Norfolk Public Schools at one point uh, was almost a beacon for schools around the country as well as around the world. I know that now we have our challenges with our schools, but I think at the same time, if we can build a model, and I know this board wants to do that. I've heard a lot of their discussions and uh, under the capable leadership of Dr. Birdsong, that that is one, at least one vehicle in which our kids can see that there's hope. And there's also, um, it can be a system where kids can be educated, be trained and bring some of that talent back into the city. Um, when I was in uh, Philadelphia, we uh, had traveled to uh, Metro Nashville and they did the Career Academy program there. And we were doing the same. And we took a lot of the tenants there. And one of the things that we found was prior to them bringing their Career Academy program there, uh, particularly in the high schools, the average age for joining a gang was 15. After giving those kids those programs and opportunities, the average age for joining a gang was 22 which means that kids were, their gang was at school and the school gave them that beacon. And what happened was they brought a lot of that talent back in. At the same time, they were working with parents. On the other side of the coin, and I'm just seeing John, it brings back some memories about when I lived in Broad Creek. Uh, when I came to Norfolk, I said, I got to live in Norfolk. I'm not going to live in the beach or Chesapeake or Suffolk. And you know, every morning when I got up, they saw me walk my dog. The kids were at the bus stay, at the bus stop. And it was almost like they said, okay, he works in the school system. And at 10 o'clock at night, 9 o'clock at night, a parent could be knocking on my door wanting to talk about someone with the schools. Or I might just be sitting on the porch. I guess what I'm trying to say is if we look at mixed income neighborhoods, I know people can live wherever they want and so forth. But... I think as we look at the redevelopment in the future of Norfolk, and I, I don't live in Norfolk right now, but I really care about my hometown and that's why I'm even on this call, that if we can look at how we can recapture some things that were really working well. And like I said, when our school system, uh, and Rodney knows this very well, uh, you have your ebb and flows, but when we were getting certain recognitions, some people said, look downtown and see the cranes because a lot of that is that people are really coming back into town and they want to see development in the city. And I think that if people can see that we have something to offer 
then we can get it done. And we have programs to offer some for all the kids, even with the current funding that we do have. And then looking at the mixed income neighborhoods, and I might be off base in some things that may have been said, I have unfortunately had a chance to read the article fully. But when I think about the Broad Creek neighborhood and how that could be spread in some different forms, we were very, very successful in working with people from a lot of different areas. And I got to know a lot of different people. People across the street from me were first time homeowners who once lived in the old Bowling Park where Broad Creek was. And of course, John knows we had um, housing association meetings where people were able to work together from different economic backgrounds. And of course, the area is still there today and doing very well. You have an anchor library there. Of course, you have the um, Salvation Army uh, Center there. All that really just took a hold of the form. But if we could just look at those kind of models like that as a building block or as a foundation, maybe that can also be a part of the discussion as we look ahead. But the discussion tonight has been so great. I'm really kind of excited. I wish I was back in Norfolk right now. But I'm just glad to hear some of the things. And I just wanted to add my two little cents worth, but I hope that things in Norfolk really turn up because I know when Norfolk has come together, it has been and still is a great city with some great people. And I know that we can do it. It's just a matter of everyone pulling together and just, and just getting it done. Thank you. Thank you, Gene. Um, uh, Ryan or Sarah, do you have anything? No, okay. Thank you, Gene. All right, um, uh, if you have any questions for us or any comments at all, uh, let us know in the chat or raise your hand virtually. Um, uh, Vivian, you're up next. Let me let me find you and ask you to unmute yourself. Um, just FYI, guys, we were planning to end at 8.30, but we'll keep going until um, at least we run out of questions maybe in the next uh, 20 minutes or so. But anyway, uh, Vivian, let me unmute you. And I'll say, uh, so thank you for everybody who's, who's already asked questions. If, if we don't get to your question or haven't answered your question fully, one, uh, we put our emails in the, in the chat earlier. Feel free to email us anytime. And also, you know, we don't have another one of these sort of on the calendar, but our, our plan has always been to, to not only do one of these and be done with it. We're hoping to have more community conversations. And so, you know, if, if you, you know, if there's more you'd like to share, you know, this, this isn't your only opportunity is what I'm saying. Because we will have to cut this off at some point. We can't go to midnight. <laughs> uh, Vivian, go ahead. So I've been taking notes as we've been going through and I try to figure out what was the most important thing that I could offer my comments on. And it has to be our political system here in Norfolk. Since we went to a ward system and how it basically disenfranchised all of us because we no longer get to vote for a majority of the members of council. We get to vote when you talk about the fact that our city cannot work together, it is by design. It is a design that says that out of eight council members, we only get to vote for three of them. So therefore, there is no way that, they, that we can all get together because they don't have to really listen to us. So of all the things that have come out tonight that have, that have continued the process that I've, rec I've seen, I've lived in Norfolk since 1978. I've lived all over this city, probably in just about every corner of this city in the length of time that I've lived here. And I've watched them do just what they're doing at, at St. Paul. I've watched them do for years and years and years. There are so many neighborhoods in Norfolk that have disappeared, that have literally disappeared. The list is so long. I was starting to write the list, thought about Robin Hood, thought about how it took 20 years to get vouchers for those people who were displaced from, from Robin Hood. Thought about how they moved into the next lowest neighborhood until they, next lowest income neighborhood until they wiped that one out too. The net bottom line is, is that it is very, very difficult for us as citizens of Norfolk to figure out a way to come together when our elected officials on council have no reason to listen to us. I'm done. Thank you, uh, Ryan. Thank you, sir. Um, a couple of couple of interesting threads there. Uh, obviously, uh, the the development of of how Norfolk's political sort of geography is split up is is really interesting. It has it has its own whole history that I'm hoping to get the chance to explore later. Um, also, the, uh, to Vivian's point about there were so you know there are a lot of neighborhoods that people who have been here for a long time would remember that you know anybody who's been here. 
20 years, 30 years, would have no idea ever even existed, right? You know, there's a lot of stories like that. Um, you know, again, uh, we're hoping to tell some of those. Um, Atlantic City is one that, you know, if you do any research at all, Atlantic City is a name that comes up uh, over and over again as this example of this, you know, neighborhood that, you know, basically existed and then didn't, right? Um, got wiped off the map. Uh, and we're hoping to, you know, we're hoping to dig in more to, to some of that history, um, you know, as well as, you know, trying to look forward. So thank you, Vivian. Okay. Um, uh, I don't have anybody else that has said that they, they have any, um, any comments or questions. Um, so I, I think that's about it. Ryan, Sarah, if you guys want to um, you know, wrap us up. Um, I'll just, uh, you know, I know there's some other questions in the chat again. Uh, I think Sarah had put in our emails. Please, please, please send us emails. Um, you know, our emails and, and our phone numbers are also at the bottom of every story we write. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us, uh, there's a million ways to do so. We, we welcome anything that anybody wants to tell us. We, we want to tell your stories. We want to hear more from everybody. Um, thank you guys so much for, for spending your Thursday evening with us. Uh, we hope that you found this uh, conversation to be as enlightening as, as I know I did. Um, you know, uh, all I can say is keep looking out. We're going to keep writing about this. There's no, you know, this isn't a traditional project. There's not going to be a set end date. We're not going to do 10 stories and then drop it or anything like that. So the plan is to keep writing, you know, for as long as there are stories to tell and to tell those stories, we need you guys to help us tell those stories. We want to tell whatever stories you've got. We want to hear. If you think we should be looking at something, drop us a line. Um, and, you know, uh, hopefully maybe some people were able to make some connections tonight too, if, if they're looking to, to, to be connected to something or get involved with discussions or whatever. Um, so that's sort of, that's sort of my spiel, Sarah. Johnny, if you guys want to say anything else, go ahead. I just wanted to thank everyone and um, feel free to reach out if you'd like to talk more. I'd love to hear from you. All right, uh, I think that's it. Johnny, do you want to say anything? Just, just a, a, a thank you to everyone, and uh, I appreciate the I, I like I appreciate the comments on the maps, and I'm we're gonna try to keep them coming. All right, thank you guys so much, and um, you know, uh, subscribe if you uh, if you are uh, you, if that's something that interests you, um, that helps us out. Um, anyway, have a good night. Thank you for thank you for joining the call, and I'm gonna end it now. Uh, there is gonna be a recording, and we'll try to get that out in case uh, you want to play it back or you want to share it with your friends. Um, that's it. But thank you so much. I'm going to end this. Bye -bye. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Bye.